Good evening. Good evening. If you have a Bible, if you have your Bible, if you would open it, please, to Isaiah chapter 44. We are going to, Lord willing, cover two chapters tonight. So we might be here to midnight, but as someone so wisely put it, what else do they have to do tonight? Isaiah 44. So just as a reminder, God's reassuring his people, reassuring them that when they go into captivity, that he will not forget them. And Isaiah has been given these visions, these visions that are yet to take place. As a matter of fact, they're well over 100 years yet in the future. And God's telling them through Isaiah, you are going to go into captivity. You are going to go into captivity into Babylon. But I haven't forgotten you. Doesn't mean I've forgotten you. Doesn't mean I've abandoned you. I'm telling you up front, this is what's going to happen. In Isaiah chapter 49, God uses this phrase, even if a nursing mother could forget her child, even if that were possible, I will never forget you. He says, you are engraved in the palms of my hands. So God reassures them that he hasn't abandoned them. In fact, he tells them he's going to send his servant Cyrus, who will do the will of God to release them from captivity. <clears throat> so can you imagine being in captivity, reading this, that this was prophesied a hundred years or more prior to this, that God had worked out all the details before you ever went into captivity. Because God knows the beginning from the end. And he did, this, he did this to show them that when they do return to the land, which they will, that it will not be by the will of man, it will not be by the power of man, but, or by what any man has done, not even Cyrus, but by the foreknowledge and power of God. And the same is true in our lives. God knows the beginning from the end. He knows how things will work out even before they happen in our lives. So that means we need to trust in him for the outcome. Amen? So Isaiah 44, verses 1 through 2. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb, and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Jacob my servant. This is a this is an affectionate term God uses for them. In Isaiah 41 8 he says, but you Israel, my servant, Jacob whom I've chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. Jeshuron, another word he uses here, is a poetic name for Israel and it means upright ones. And so these are two affectionate titles that God applies to Israel. God hasn't forgotten. God hasn't abandoned them. He has called them by name. They are his friend. They are his chosen. They are his redeemed. God tells us that when we walk through the fire, when they tells them when they walk through the fire, they will not be burned. When they walk through the waters, he will be with them. When they walk through the rivers, they will not be overwhelmed. So God is reassuring them that they're not alone in this. However, however, they're still going to suffer the consequences for their sin. They're going to go into captivity in Babylon for their idol worship and for their disobedience. Chastisement, which is what this is basically, doesn't mean God doesn't love them. It, it, it's because he loves them that he's chastising them. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? God chastises those whom he loves. God reassures them. He's chosen them. He's formed them from the womb, meaning Israel originated because God had chosen them. Remember Abraham? When Abraham was in the Ur of Chaldees, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. As a result of this promise, Abraham became the originator of the Jewish people. Oh, we have a screen up there. Nice. 
He himself wasn't a Jew, by the way. Did you know that? Abraham was not Jewish. Jews didn't exist at this point. Abraham was, in fact, a Gentile, a pagan Gentile, who was from a land steeped in idolatry, so Abraham would have been an idol worshiper. So that makes you wonder, right, why would God choose Abraham? Well, I would say it's because God knew that when he did call Abraham, that Abraham would go, that Abraham had the faith to go. And possibly Abraham was the only one who did. So God called him. God used him. The author of Hebrews writes, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Can you imagine being called out of your home, told you're going to a place where I'm going to make you a great nation, but you have no idea where that place is? You have no idea where it is. You have no idea how God's going to use you or make this come, come to pass. But you have faith enough to go because God told you to go. So God chose him, and Abraham became the originator of the nation because God promised that through him he would make him a great nation, and God would keep that promise. Even after they were in captivity for 70 years in Babylon, God would once again reunite them to the land. And the same is true for us. God keeps his promises. God chastises us sometimes, some, some of us more than others. Some of us need it more than others. I know I'm in that category, but it means he loves us. We may still face the consequences of our sin, and sometimes it's that, that is the consequence of our sin. That is the chastisement, that we face the consequences of our sin. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. As it was true for Israel, it's true for us. It means that it's, it's proof positive that God loves us because he chastises us. Now, I was watching a police video the other day, and a young girl was reported as hitting a light pole and damaging her vehicle. So the police find her a short time later in a gas station. They discover after an investigation that she is under the influence, and so they arrest her for DUI. And she asks that her father, who was a sheriff in the same county, be notified that she's been arrested. And so they call him, and he comes to the scene, and after hearing all, hearing all the details, he says to his daughter, you're under arrest for DUI. That's justice. She received what she deserved. Now imagine that same father coming to that scene and uncuffing his daughter and setting her free, putting the cuffs on himself and then taking the charge of DUI upon himself and just letting her go. That's grace. That's grace. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. He took our sin, suffered the consequences of our sin, setting us free, declaring us not guilty. Now, God may chastise us, and that chastisement may be in the form of what I said, suffering our consequences. But he loved us enough to send his son to die for our sin so that we will never suffer the wrath of God for our sin. We may suffer the consequences of it, but we will never suffer the wrath for it. Amen? Verse 3, For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I'm the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. So when Babylon invaded Jerusalem three times, mind you, three times this happened, the city and the temple were laid waste. So from that desolate ground, God's going to bring growth. He's going to pour out his spirit upon these people, blessing them and blessing their offspring. And we see this even to this day. Israel is a blessed nation. Israel has accomplished much over the centuries. This tiny little nation in the Middle East leads the world in so many areas, just a few. They lead the world in water and agricultural technology. They lead the world in high tech. They lead the world in medical devices and humanitarian aid. So God has blessed them, and through them, they have been a blessing to the world. One of the greatest effects of God pouring out a spirit upon them is they will finally one day realize whom it is they belong to. They belong to God. Their offspring 
will also have the Spirit poured out upon him. And it's not just limited to the Jewish people. Abraham is the father of many nations who believed. And the Holy Spirit would not only be poured out on the Jewish people, but on all who believe. Jesus will say in John's Gospel, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 7, verses 37 through 38. All who believe are the offspring. Abraham has become the father of faith, the originator of all who believe. Verse 6. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Beside me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. I have not told you from of old and declared it. And you are my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? There is no rock. I know not any. God is the only God. You know, the four living creatures in Revelation say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. God who was, is, and is to come is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. There is none like him. The only God, only one God, the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, knows the beginning from the end. And as I said before, and it bears repeating as a reminder, God is not only outside of space and time, he is not bound by space and time. He sees everything from its beginning to its end, all at the same time. He saw us before we were formed in our mother's womb. He sees the day when we'll close our eyes here on this earth for the last time. And he also sees us in heaven with him, all at the same time, in the same vision, in one complete picture. Now, there's no way to, to adequately explain that because of our finite minds. But God sees our lives from our birth to our death to eternity all at the same time. He knows who we were before we were born. And he knows who we will be. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows how all this chaos and this turmoil that we see all around the world will end. And God told Israel what's going to happen, how it would happen, and what the conclusion would be. And he's done the same for us, hasn't he? It's called the book of Revelation. We know how this all ends. We know how this ends because God has told us how it ends. Only our God could do that because only our God knows the beginning from the end. No man, no idol could ever do that and because of that god is going to describe now in these next verses the absolute folly of worshiping idols verse 9 through 20 all who fashion idols are nothing and the things they delight in do not profit their witnesses neither see nor know and they may be put to shame who fashions a god or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing behold and what he's saying here is no, no metal worker, no, no goldsmith or silversmith is going to fashion an idol and not sell it. They were made for profit. That's the reason they're made. Behold, all, this, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them all assemble. Let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it... With his strong arm, he becomes hungry, and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint, as I drink water. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man, with the beauty of man, to dwell in a house. God is saying, man makes his own gods in his own image. He cuts down cedars or chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. 
Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it from that same piece of wood. He makes an idol and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the other half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. And he prays to it, Deliver me, for you are my god. They know not, nor do they discern, for his eyes for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it burned in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I ro roasted meat and have eaten, and I shall make the rest of it an abomination. Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Psalm 115, the psalmist writes this. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their gods are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not feel feet but do not walk and they do not make a sound in their throat those who make them become like them so do all who trust in them <clears throat> now notice the carpenter who makes the idols out of wood selects a very specific tree a cedar tree cedar trees are impervious to rot you wouldn't want your god to rot would you so you have to use a special tree, special wood, to carve your idol from. Making an idol is hard work. I mean, look at all the work that they had to do to make these idols. You gotta cut down a tree, you gotta carve an idol, you gotta melt the metal, you gotta form it into a, a, a shape of a man. That's hard work. And so the, pa the person fashioning these idols needs to eat, needs to warm himself by the fire. God's pointing out that what you have are weak humans creating weak gods. Gods that cannot see, gods that cannot hear or walk or speak. You know, we look at that and we think, well, there's no idol worship today. But there is, isn't there? And I'm going to point out just one particular one because I know of people who do this. Think of the guy or the girl who restores cars. That car becomes their idol. And if you've ever known anybody who's ever restored a car, you know that that's true. Every day. You find them in that garage, lovingly, painstakingly, meticulously restoring that car. No expense is out of the question. They pour their time and their money and their hard work into that project. But what is it that their car is going to do for them? Give them a few years of driving around town, maybe? It's like owning a boat. It takes more money from you. It takes more out of you than it gives you. And over time, that car will just going to rust. The engine's going to fail because it's made by human hands. It's not made to last. That car cannot deliver or save. And if that's what you're trusting in, then you're lost. And that's just one example because you can substitute restoring a car for just about anything else that we place over worshiping the only true God. Whatever takes up our time, whatever takes us away from God, whatever takes our resources has become an idol to us. And an idol is a god. And you may not see it like that, but you have made a god for yourself. And the reason you can't see it like that is because you have been deceived. You've deceived yourself. You've become like your idol. You can't see or hear what it's doing to you. You might argue, well, it's just a hobby. It's just a car. It's just a whatever. It's, a, it's a, an interest. It's harmless, right? It's harmless. It's something to do. That's what you believe because you've deceived yourself into believing that. You're no different than the ancient idol worshiper who took a piece of wood and made part of it his God and then with the other part built a fire and cooked his food on it. And there's a danger in continually deceiving yourself into believing that there is no God, that you're, that you're not worshiping a God made by your hands, and, and, and that what you're doing is harmless, because if you continue to believe that lie long enough, 
As Paul describes it, your conscience will be seared with a hot iron. You'll become so deceived that you'll believe that lie and there won't be any turning back. And I pray that if, if anyone who hears this message, message, if that speaks to you, if that describes you, and you can see the absolute futility in placing your trust in anything or anyone other than the one true God, that the scales would fall from your eyes. Verse 21. Remember these things, O Jacob, in Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You are my servant, O Israel. You will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest, and every tree in it, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. So all the earth rejoices over what God's done in, the, in, in, in Israel and what God's doing with the people of Israel. Through all of this, Israel is going to be taught a very valuable lesson. Their idols could not keep them from being taken captive into Babylon, and it couldn't keep the northern kingdom from being taken captive into Assyria. The idols and all the false gods that the Babylonians worshipped couldn't keep them from being taken over by the Medes and the Persians. So these idols are worthless. And then they remember what God did for them, how he delivered them out of Egypt, how God told them exactly what would happen and how all this would end. And they even put a time frame on it, not even a, so much a time frame, but gave them a name. And we're going to get to that in a few minutes. But here's what touches my heart about all this. Despite Israel, despite Israel turning from him, despite Israel disobeying him, God pleads with them, pleads with them to return to him. You know, the Bible is all about God seeking man to return to him. Jesus came to this earth while we were still sinners, seeking us to turn from our sin and turn to God. Yes, the Bible tells us to seek God, but God is seeking us as well. Didn't Jesus tell us a parable about a lost sheep and a lost coin? Both of those parables illustrate God seeking after us to return to him. After all we've done, it's hard to believe that God wants us. He wants us to seek after him. He sent his son to die for us, to prove how much he loves us, and, the, and prove to us the extent that he's willing to go to make us his own. Thus says the Lord, verse 24, your Redeemer who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fool of div fools of div diviners who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant and fulfills, and fulfills the counsel of his messengers, who says to Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah they shall be built, and it will raise up their ruins, who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers, who says to Cyrus, now he mentions his name, he is my shepherd and I shall fulfill all my purpose, saying to Jerusalem, she shall be built, and of the temple your foundation shall be laid. When Babylon attacked Israel, they destroyed the city. They destroyed the temple. And when you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you see exactly the fulfillment of this prophecy, that God used them and the remnant who returned to rebuild the city and the walls and the temple, and the altar, and all of it. And it's through that that we actually have one of the most amazing prophecy in all of Scripture, where Daniel gives us the 70 weeks. And we're not going to dig into that tonight, but it all stems from what happens in Ezra and Nehemiah. So up to this point, God has only alluded to who he would send to deliver them from captivity. We can look back on history and know that it was Cyrus, but all God's told them so far was, who has stirred up the king from the east, meaning the Persians, rightly calling him to God's service, who gave this man victory over many nations and permits him to trample their kings underfoot. With his sword, he reduces armies to dust. With his bow, he scatters them like the chaff before the wind, Isaiah 41, 2. All they knew that he would come from the east. 
and that God would give him victory over many nations. That's all they really knew. But now God amazingly gives them his name. And you have to remember what's so amazing about this is this happens almost 150 years before this guy is even born. The servant of God who would come from the east would be Cyrus. Only God, only God who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread the earth by himself, only God could predict such a thing. Who chooses what's foolish in this world to shame the wise. The God who chooses the weak of this world to shame the strong. Only this God, only the one true God, could tell who would deliver the people more than a hundred years before he would even be born. God knew Cyrus before he was formed in his mother's womb. God had already planned how he would use Cyrus before he was ever brought forth. And Daniel, one day, would show Cyrus this very passage of Scripture that we just read when he came into the city. And Cyrus was so amazed by that passage of scripture, knowing that God had called him to a specific purpose, just as God has called all of us to a specific purpose and set us apart from the womb. Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 3. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings. This is one of the most amazing passages of the scripture and prophecy in the book of Isaiah. And you're going to see here in a moment why I say that. To open doors before him, the gates may not be closed. I will go before you and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness in the hor and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who will call you by your name. Imagine being Cyrus and having this passage of Scripture shown to you as you enter into Jerusalem. It's an amazing prophecy, as is most of Isaiah. Because if you know how Cyrus took Babylon, you would know just how amazing this prophecy is. Now, that account is found in Daniel chapter 5, and time doesn't allow us to do a study in Daniel chapter 5, so I'm going to cherry-pick through some of Daniel 5 to give you an idea of what God's talking about here. In verse 1 of Daniel 5, we find that the Babylonian king is Belshazzar, who, by the way, is Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. He's drunk, and he's about to make some really bad decisions. I don't know about you, but no decisions being, I've never made any good decisions being drunk. Most people don't make good decisions while drinking. So we find him, and just to clarify, that was before I knew Christ, okay? So we find him here in this huge banquet hall, and he's having a huge blowout party. And to give you an idea of just how arrogant this guy is, while they're partying, the Medes and the Persians are outside the city trying to get in. They've been out there for a while. But because the walls are impenetrable, they are 350 feet high and they are 87 feet thick, wide. This place was impregnable. It is said that you could raise six chariots abreast around the walls of Babylon. It was siege proof because they had livestock and vegetables within the walls of the city and they had an infinite amount of water because the Euphrates went right through the city. In addition to the thick walls and the food and the water, there were huge iron gates that protected the city. These gates, by the way, happened to be happened to be right where the Euphrates River came into the city. So these huge iron gates were right there. So the city's impregnable, or at least that's what the king thought. Now, I can picture them all sitting around having this great party, just enjoying themselves. They're, they've got all the, all the temple in implements from, from when Nebuchadnezzar took them out of the temple, and they're drinking out of God's cups and the stuff that the priests would drink out of. And they're just having a good old time for themselves, and they think they're safe behind this massive fortress. So they let their guard down, and they get drunk. They're oblivious to the danger that's all around them. So while they're drinking, and they're taking vessels from the temple, and while they're doing all this, this hand just appears out of, into thin air, out of thin air. And it writes on a wall. 
Now, Daniel tells us this is the hand of God. And he writes on the wall of the banquet, banquet hall, he writes, Mini, Mini, Tekel, Eupharsin. So no one knows what this means. So they call Daniel to interpret it. And he tells the king, Mini means your days are numbered and your kingdom is being brought to an end. Tekel means that you've been weighed and measured and balances and have been found wanting. Perez means your kingdom has been divided among the Medes and the Persians. Now here's a Bible trivia question for you guys. There are three times in the Bible where we see the hand of God writing something. Anyone know what they are? We start the Jeopardy music. Give you two minutes and I'm... Anyone? No one? Jesus is writing in the sand. That's actually the hardest of the three you got. I just gave you one. God just wrote on the banquet hall wall, right? And the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Too slow, Walter. So when the king sees this hand appear and writing on the wall, his countenance changes. I mean, that's a pretty scary sight, right? In other words, the color drained from his face and he became pale white. His mind begins to race. He's scared because he has no idea how this happened, how this could possibly happen. And the Bible tells us the joints of his hips were loosened. The King James Version says his loins were loosed, meaning he soiled himself. That's how scared he was. I mean, listen, nothing brings out the true character of a man in a crisis. And that's what Isaiah says here. He says that God will loose the belts or the loins of kings. God predicted this would happen over 150 years before it actually happened. As I said, the Medes and the Persians were already outside the city, right? But they're unable to breach these massive walls. However, they had a plan that was already in effect to enter the city another way. Cyrus, the Persian king, sent a division of his army to where the Euphrates, the, Euphrates, the Euphrates River entered the city, right? He gave them instructions that when they saw the river dry up, they were to enter the city along the dried riverbed. So he takes the rest of his army to where the Euphrates and a swamp nearby were located next to each other, and he diverts the river into the swamp, drying up the Euphrates River. And Cyrus was able to walk right under these huge gates, or some scholars, some believe that the gates were actually open because they were so arrogant they left the gates open. Just as God told Isaiah, I will break to pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. The Babylonians were so arrogant they had no clue the danger around them and they allowed the Medes and the Persians to just cut right through their bronze gates. So the army walks right in. They surround the banquet hall Belshazzar and all the lords who are there are put to death. It takes days for the people of the city to actually realize that they've been taken over by the Medes and the Persians because this happened so seamlessly. So Cyrus enters the city, and he's met by Daniel at the gate. And Daniel reads him this prophecy that contains his name, written hundred, over 100 years before he entered the city. And Cyrus is so impressed by this that he promotes Daniel, and eventually he's going to allow the captives to return to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the temple. And you can read that in the book of Nehemiah. So this is an amazing prophecy given by God to Isaiah and the people. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there's no other. Beside me there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that my people may know. From the rising of the sun, from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. God tells Isaiah that he acted on behalf of the people for their sake. You know, when, in Egypt, when the people under captivity, when they cried out to God, God sent Moses to deliver them. 
When they're in Babylon, they finally cry out to God, and God sends Cyrus to deliver them. God acted. He acted on their behalf. He sent them a deliverer for their sake so that they would know that he is God, that there's none like him, that God had not forgotten him. God named Cyrus, called him by name, called him his servant, even though Cyrus had no idea who the God of Israel was. But through Cyrus, all would know who the God of Israel was because we see this prophecy fulfilled in the book of Ezra. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, not Cyrus, but the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Listen what this pagan Gentile king proclaims. That God is the God of heaven, that he's the God of Israel, that he is the God of Jerusalem. And, and he even acknowledges that it is God who gave him the victory. He's acknowledging that it is God who's in control, that he's the only God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amazing what this Gentile proclaims, what the people in Israel had a hard time proclaiming. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open, that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or your work has no handles? Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what, with what are you in labor? So God provides both salvation and righteousness. And we know from Scripture that there is no other name by which we can be saved than by the name of Jesus. And it's only through him that we are made righteous. So woe to anyone who strives, who fights against his creator. And God says, should a pot, should a jar of clay criticize the potter? the one who fashioned it out of clay, the one who made it? God's saying, who says to their mother or father, why did you conceive me? We're God's creation. And as his creator, he has the right to design each of us for a very specific purpose, and he has. But one thing I know for certain, God only made two, two models of clay. He made one male and one female. Now, there's many different shapes and sizes and colors of those two models, but there's only two models, male and female. Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and the one who formed him, ask me of things to come, and I will command, ask me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their hosts, I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all his ways level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Now he's referring to Cyrus again. Now, if you've been paying attention as we're reading through these verses, God has been emphasizing the fact that he's creator, right? And the importance of that, because God's placing importance on it, is so that we understand that whoever rejects God as creator rejects the God of the Bible. And when we reject the God of the Bible, we're serving a God of our own imagination, of our own making. Because whether we'll admit it or not, we all serve someone or something. And if you're not serving the one true God, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then you're serving the God of this world, Satan. There is no, there is no middle ground. You either serve God or you're serving Satan. So God emphasizes that he's creator, that he's the one in control. No idol could possibly predict what's going to happen hundreds of years before it happens. God, who is creator, who not only is creator, but sustains everything, 
God says, I am going to use my servant Cyrus to set my people free and rebuild my city. And he's told these people ahead of time so that when it does happen, they know that it is he, God alone, who has made this happen. So that they know that he is God and there's none like him. Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabines and the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall, fo they shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other, no God beside him. Truly, you are a God who hides himself, the, O God of Israel, the Savior. All of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go in confusion together. But Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded to all eternity. One day, all the nations are going to bow, not to Israel, but to the God of Israel. For too long, Israel's believed that God has hidden himself from them when it was in fact they who had hidden themselves from God. God has clearly said that when we seek him, we will find him. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name and humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. The reason God seems hidden to you is because you aren't seeking him. The reason God seems to be distant is be, he has, doesn't mean he's abandoned you. It means you've stopped seeking him. God's always there. That's a promise that he's given us. I will never leave you or forsake you. So when you can't feel his presence, it isn't because he's left you. It's because you've stopped seeking him. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there's no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. I am the Lord, I the Lord speak the truth. I declare what is right. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, you survivors of the nations. They have no knowledge who carry about their wooden idols and keep on praying to a God that cannot save. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told you this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God beside me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none beside me. When Israel finally was allowed to return to the land, only a remnant went back. Tens of thousands went into captivity, but only a remnant went back. Most of them assimilated and stayed in the Babylonian culture. They continued worshiping the idols. Listen, God's not going to tell his people to seek him if he can't be found, right? And God continues to reiterate what I've already said because we need to constantly be reminded of who he is and what he has said. Why do we need to be reminded? Well, he says he's God and there's none like him, right? Yet many continue to worship idols. He says he is the creator, yet many continue to worship the creation rather than the creator. He said he knows the beginning from the end, yet many believe they're in control of their own destiny. He said he's a righteous God and Savior, yet many continue to believe in their own righteousness, that they can save themselves. He said he will never leave us or forsake us, yet we think he's left us when it is us who are not seeking him. So you see, we need to be reminded of who he is, that he is the one true God and there's no one like him. Turn to me, verse 22, and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there's no other. By myself I have sworn, for my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Only in the Lord I shall be set, it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength. 
To him shall come and be ashamed all who are incensed against him. In the Lord, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. This is one of probably one of the most important verses in the Bible. Turn to God and be saved, all the ends of the earth. It's God's message of salvation, a message that's supposed to be carried or God wants carried to the ends of the earth. Isn't that what Jesus said? But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Listen, you can bow your heart, you can surrender your life and submit your will to Jesus now as Savior, or you can wait until you're standing before him in the great white throne judgment, and you will bow your knee to the King of kings and Lord of lords, only sadly, at that point, it will be too late. Paul wrote to the Philippians, so that the name of, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God has gone out of his way to assure Israel that he is God, that he loves them, that he cares for them, that he's redeeming them, that he hasn't abandoned them, that he is with them. And by the way, he's gone out of his way to assure us of the very same thing. Yet many continue to reject him. Many continue to reject the free gift of salvation through his son. And it's because of the Christ-rejecting world that we live in that the world's in the condition that it's in today, that our nation's in the condition that it's in today, that our global community's in the condition that it's in today. So now more than ever, we must be reminded of who God is that he's the creator of all things, that all things consist and are sustained through him because we need to remember who we serve. We serve a God that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what we can think or imagine. And the reason that's important is because it's important to know who we're praying to, who we are seeking. We're praying to the creator of the universe, the one true God who is the only one who can change things. Not a king, not a president, not a prime minister. Only God can change the course of events that we're facing today. Only God can change what happens in our lives. Amen?